one of the one of my more recent hobby horses within the last like six months or so is uh looking at the effects of range of motion on hypertrophy um because i there's a lot of i i mean there has been for several years a, a lot of just like chatter in the evidence-based fitness community about how uh full range of motion training through a full range of motion is very important for hypertrophy uh and I kind of don't think that full range of motion matters all that much. Um, I think that when people talk about the benefits of full range of motion training for muscle growth, I think ultimately they're just picking up on the benefits of ensuring that your reps do include the portion of the rep that involves uh, muscular tension at long muscle lengths. But I don't think the range of motion is all that important per se. So for example... Um, if you're doing something that has a where full range motion is 120 degrees at a particular joint, I think that the benefits of training through a full range of motion rather than a partial range of motion is that when people talk about partials, they tend to just be talking about the top half of the range of motion. So for example, if you're doing bench press, uh, you lock the bar out between every rep, but you only go midway down to your chest. Um, so when, when people talk about partials, they think about something like that or like half squats, for example. Um, and so when you're using that as your model of partial range of motion training, what you do tend to find is that full range of motion training, uh, improves outcomes. So training all the way from zero degrees of flexion to 120. Uh, but I, I kind of think that if you just train from 120 degrees to 60 degrees and cut out the top part, kind of the classic, um, uh, constant tension training approach. I think that's just as good as training through a full range of motion. Um, cause ultimately I think it's less that just the total angular displacement at each joint matters. And it's more so, um, ensuring that you are training through the part with long muscle links. And, and I kind of think the part where you're training through short muscle links, um, you know, just has a neutral effect. So whether or not you lock out each rep doesn't really matter all that much. So with uh, with that introduction out of the way, I reviewed uh, two studies in mass this past year that are directly relevant to that. Uh, so the title of the first one was partial range of motion training might increase muscle growth, uh, parentheses, if you do the right type of partials. So this was a study by Pedrosa and colleagues. Uh, the title was Partial Range of Motion Training Elicits Favorable Improvements in Muscular Adaptations When Carried Out at Long Muscle Lengths. Um, so in this study, uh, five groups of untrained women uh, completed a 12-week training protocol. Uh, one of the groups was a non-training control group. Uh, and then the other four groups... Um, trained knee extensions for 12 weeks. So one of the groups did all of their reps through a full range of motion. One of the groups did all of their reps through a partial range of motion uh, in a decent bit of knee flexion. So basically the bottom half of the range of motion, which uh, coincides with long muscle lengths for the quadriceps. Uh, one group did partials, but just through the top half of the range of motion. So the part of the range of motion that would have uh, th that would be through short muscle links of the quadriceps. One group did varied partial range of motion. So they did half of their reps, partials at long muscle links, half of them partials at short muscle links. And the final group was uh, just a full range of motion group where they, you know, did full range of motion reps. Uh, so they trained for 12 weeks and they looked at growth of the vastus lateralis and rectus femoris at uh, three different sites so, or four different sites. So from a proximal site at 40% of femur length. So that's, uh, if you go from the hip to the knee, uh, starting at the hip, going down 40% of femur length, that was the most proximal site. And then 70% of femur length, so closer to the knee, that was the most distal site. Um, so yeah, uh, there were, I mean, there, there were a shitload of pairwise comparisons here. But the, the broad strokes are that um, the partial range of motion at long muscle lengths group had overall the best hypertrophy response uh, of all of the four training groups and, and certainly better than the control group. Um, 
but but that group, the full range of motion group and the variable range of motion partial group uh, all had pretty solid hypertrophy outcomes. The partial range of motion group just training at short muscle lengths uh, tended to grow quite a bit less than the other three groups, particularly in the distal parts of the muscle. So the 40 and 50 percent of femur length sites, the more the more proximal parts uh, tended to grow pretty well in all of the groups, but then the more distal sites tended to grow the best in the three groups that did involve training at long muscle lengths. Um, and, and like I mentioned, the group that just did partials at long muscle lengths got at least as good of hypertrophy results as any of the other groups and arguably better than any of the other groups. Um, so that, that was some, uh, direct evidence that the range of motion through which you're training partials matters a lot. And that if you're doing the partials at long muscle lengths, they may actually produce slightly more hypertrophy than training just through a full range of motion. Uh, and then there was a, a more recent study, um, by Sato and colleagues that I just reviewed last month, uh, elbow joint angles in elbow flexor unilateral resistance exercise training determine its effects on muscle strength and thickness of trained and non-trained arms. So in this study, subjects did unilateral preacher curls. Uh, there wasn't a full range of motion group in this study. It was just partials at long muscle lengths versus partials at short muscle lengths. Uh, and subjects were doing unilateral preacher curls, uh, and, and the findings were very similar. So they had three different measurement sites here, uh, 50, 60, and 70% of humerus length. Overall, hypertrophy was greater in the group doing partials at long muscle lengths than the group doing partials at short muscle lengths, uh, and the magnitude of difference increased as you moved towards more distal sites along the muscle. Um, and then when averaging all three sites together, the group doing the long the long muscle length partials uh, experience like 2.6 times more hypertrophy than the group doing short muscle length partials. Um, so again, not a direct comparison in that study to full range of motion training, but uh, very clear evidence that not all partials are created equal. Um, partials at short muscle lengths tend to not cause as much growth overall. And in particular, there's a pretty big difference at distal muscle sites. So like, for example, if you wanted, uh, and, and, th and this is going to depend to some degree on like tendon length and overall muscle architecture, but kind of like in a vacuum, if you just want like a big, like freaky horseshoe tricep that hangs over your elbow or just like big freaky quads that like look like they're about to swallow up your knees, uh, those are distal muscle sites and, and training through long muscle links tends, tends to be very important uh, for growth in those sites. And there's also uh, more evidence just from isometric training that, you know, not even doing reps, but just tension per se at long muscle links um, ten, tends to promote uh, hypertrophy quite well. So there was a, a systematic review by Oren Chuck and colleagues, I think in 2019, uh, isometric training and long-term adaptations effects of muscle length intensity and intent a systematic review uh, and, and one of the things they looked at in that systematic review was isometric training at long versus short muscle lengths finding that uh, hypertrophy tended to be quite a bit greater when you did isometric training at long muscle lengths than short um, and there there's also evidence i think that uh including the part of the range of motion that coincides with short muscle length. So essentially locking out every rep um, maybe doesn't matter all that much and could potentially be slightly harmful for hypertrophy. Uh, and I think that probably depends on whether kind of the lockout position does keep you under tension or not. But there was a study by Godo and colleagues um, looking at triceps growth with uh, partial range of motion versus full range of motion uh, barbell tricep extensions, basically skull crushers. Uh, one of the groups trained through a full range of motion, so from zero to 120 degrees of elbow flexion. One of the groups uh, did partials just through the mid range of motion. So uh, at the bottom, they stopped at 90 degrees of elbow flexion, and then they went up to 45 degrees of elbow flexion, but they didn't actually lock the reps out. Uh, and in that study, 
I they didn't assess hypertrophy, I think, in the most using using gold standard methods. They they used a regression equation based on uh arm circumferences and skin fold thicknesses, which so you it's know been not, done, but yeah, yeah, it's 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 not the best way to assess hypertrophy. So take it with a slight grain of salt, but they they did find that uh, estimates of tricep cross-sectional area derived from arm circumference and uh, skin fold thicknesses increased to, to a greater extent in the group that basically skipped lockout, uh, even though they didn't actually go down as far um, into elbow flexion on each rep. So I, I think that when you kind of triangulate all of that, um, I, I would definitely like to see more direct comparisons uh, specifically between long muscle length partials and full range of motion before I could make any sort of definitive statement. Um, because currently we do just have one study making that direct, direct comparison. Um, and it's looking at just single joint exercises in untrained individuals. So, you know, you probably don't want to put too many eggs in that basket. But I, I think that there are several different lines of evidence that one could point to, to, sh to say that, you know, at worst, um, partials through a long partials, uh, at, in, in long muscle length positions rather than short muscle length positions. Uh, I think you can say at worst, that's going to cause more hypertrophy than partials just through short muscle length positions you know, uh, kind of for now discounting the comparison to full range of motion training. So I think we can very confidently say not all partials are created equal. Um, but I, I do, I do kind of think that, uh, if you do like quote unquote constant tension training, you do partials, but the part of the range of motion you're cutting out is like the lockout portion, the short muscle length portion, uh, I kind of think that you're going to grow just as much as you would from doing full range of motion training and possibly slightly more. Um, and another thing I'll note is that when, when we talk about, uh, when we talk about the effects of range of motion on hypertrophy, I think it's also worth nuancing that just a little bit. Uh, so the, the differences don't seem to be, um, kind of evenly dispersed across the length of a muscle. So if you compare kind of quote unquote normal partial range of motion training, so, you know, now we're talking half squats, bench presses that don't touch your chest, et cetera. Um, when we look at that type of partial compared to either long muscle length partials or full range of motion training in studies that assess hypertrophy at multiple different muscle sites, what they tend to find is that for more proximal muscle sites, you actually seem to grow about the same amount regardless of range of motion. So, you know, uh, if you're assessing changes in quad size closer to the hip or changes in tricep size closer to the shoulder, for example, um, seems like those proximal sites tend to grow pretty well <laughs> regardless of how you're training, but that uh, either partials at long muscle lengths or full range of motion training that includes training at long muscle lengths that tends to be pretty essential for fully growing more distal parts of the muscle. So overall, full range of motion training does beat short muscle length partials, but the the uh, effects aren't evenly distributed across the muscle. There There is that regional component, which I personally think is kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, I suspect that some people at my gym kind of suspect that I'm a dumbass. Uh, and, and the reason is... I think I think some people struggle to warm up to the idea of partials at short uh or I'm sorry partials at long muscle lengths. Well, they also think you're a dumbass because you thought that simply the fact that a magnet wouldn't stick to you immediately after you got a vaccine negated their argument that vaccines would stick to you immediately after you got a vaccine. I'm not sure if we ever actually mentioned that on the show. We, we did for sure. <laughs> okay. We did. Okay. So that that's a throwback. Uh, at first I was like, I don't think anyone has context for that. No, but um, I think some people struggle to warm up to this idea of partials at long muscle lengths because uh, back in the day, you would call that cheating, right? So like, for example, a lot of times uh, I'll be doing bicep curls. This is one of the areas where I, I use a little bit of this, but I'll do full range of motion bicep curls 
until I can no longer. And then I will do a few extra reps at the end of doing partial range of motion. And it'll be up to that sticking point, which is, you know, I'm training exclusively at longer uh, muscle lengths for, for those partials. And so I think the the typical person passing by would say, look at this jackass who's counting these reps and he's like not even getting halfway up. Uh, but it's it's intentional. Uh, and I think, you know, like you said, I, I don't know if it's necessarily doing too much, but like it's a nice little supplementary thing to help me get a little bit more effort into that set. Is it going to pay off big time? I don't know. But I, I do similar things uh, depending on, you know, what I'm trying to accomplish in the set. But sometimes I'll do similar things for like a dumbbell incline press. I'll do full range of motion until I'm kind of struggling uh, at that kind of sticking point in the middle. Then I'll get some nice loaded stretches. I'll keep everything at the longer muscle lengths for my pecs mm -hmm. and get a few extra reps to, to really uh, to really grind out the set. And so I think the typical passerby would say, those reps don't count. That guy's a jackass. But then I take off my top layer and I'm wearing a stringer and they say, holy shit. That looks like the kind of guy that is so muscular that it would hold him back at the professional yeah, bodybuilding level. He wouldn't level. even have been able to win the 1991 Miss Olympia. They would have given it to someone less muscular. That's what they think. So, but when I'm not when I'm not wearing a stringer and I have bulky clothing on, I don't think they can tell, you know. But anyway, I, I use a little bit of this partial range of motion stuff, and it's pretty nice. I like it. Sweet. Uh, the the area where where I've always used it is uh, dumbbell flies. Like I've talked about my love of the pec deck machine on yeah. this podcast oh, several yeah. times before, but I'm training in my basement now, uh, you know, just have dumbbells, don't have a pec deck, don't have room for a pec deck. If I did, I definitely get a pec deck. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I enjoy Dude, you don't need a whole kitchen. Just get rid of part of your kitchen and Fuck put in no, a pec deck. Absolutely not. Um, but yeah, no. So I, I like pec training. I think that, um, I think that I'm the only, maybe the only person in the world who has a pec dominant pull up. Like when you're, <laughs> when your arms are, when your arms are above your head, your pecs do have slight shoulder extension functionality. And uh, when I'm good at pull ups, like w when I've been doing pull ups somewhat frequently and I can do a decent number in a set, I always get an enormous pec pump from pull ups. Like, I, I think I get a, a bigger pec pump than lat pump. Um, anyway, I, I think that just about every upper body exercise I do somehow turns out to be pec dominant. Uh, so I, I like pec training. I just think it's fun. And so when I do dumbbell flies, I, and I'm, man, this goes back to when I was like 12 years old and I was first introduced to the exercise. Um, like I was doing like full range of motion, dumbbell pec flies on a bench in the local YMCA. Um, and this older gentleman comes up to me and he said, you want me to teach you how to do flies? And this guy, I think I may have mentioned him on the podcast before. He was one of my first training partners. I had two very fun training partners at that YMCA. One of them was this guy I'm about to mention. The other one was a bounty hunter. And... Um, <laughs> His name wasn't Dog, was it? His name, I shit you, this wasn't his real name, but everyone referred to him as Cornbread. Um, <laughs> so, Cornbread the Bounty Hunter. And he, uh, if we ever do merchandise, we have to have a Cornbread <laughs> the Bounty Hunter character. Yeah. Uh, anyway, both excellent training partners. They taught me a lot, and also they, they both had uh, excellent stories. But anyway... Um, completely neglecting the stories for now this was this was my first introduction to this older gentleman and he was in his either late 60s or early 70s but still had a he he still had a very solid physique um and yeah he 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 could tell that i didn't really know what i was doing so he's like you want me to teach you how to really do peck flies and i said okay sure absolutely i i would love to learn uh and so he, I think one of the reasons why I'm kind of open to the whole idea of long muscle length partials is that's all this guy did. Um, like, you know, he, he would do, he would do weighted pull-ups again, like in his late sixties, early seventies, he'd have like a, either a plate or a plate and a 25 hanging off of him, but he'd only do like a seven inch range of motion. Like by the time the top of his head was level with the bar, 
he was done. Concentric was over. Time to go back down. I actually like that as well. Uh, and, and he he approached everything the same way. So yeah. like you know he'd do dumbbell press, go all the way down at the bottom, push it up about four inches, go back down. Like that that's how he approached all of his training. Um, so anyway, he taught me that method of pec flies. Like go down until you get a deep stretch, go up until like you still feel a lot of tension on the muscle, but it's not acutely stretched anymore. And then just go back down. So we're talking pec flies through maybe a six inch range of motion. Yeah. And like I'd done flies before because I'd seen them in a magazine and someone big said, this is a good exercise. Uh, but like that was the first time that the next day my pecs felt absolutely destroyed. Yeah. So I was like, hell yeah, this is how I do flies now. And I've always done that. Like I, I never go all the way up on flies. Um, and I think that that's probably in a, a pretty extreme example, just because the mechanical leverage is so low at the bottom and yeah. so high at the top. But I, I think a similar principle can apply to most exercises you do. 